Um, okay, so uh, thank you, Tal, for introducing me, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I'm always glad for an excuse to come back and visit uh, New York City. Um, so this work is joint with uh, Mukul Kulkarni and Arya Shaverdi at University of Maryland. Um, and also in this talk, uh, beyond the main result, I'm also going to be giving some background, uh, which is based on previous work, uh, joint with uh, Feng Tao Liu, Elaine Shi, and Hong Sheng Zhu. Um, so the previous talks uh, so far today have all been talking about uh, complexity in terms of minimal assumptions. So like what are the minimal computational assumptions needed to achieve uh, some desirable crypto system? Um, and in contrast, what I'm going to be talking about is complexity in terms of efficiency. Uh, so what is the best possible efficiency that we can get for certain types of crypto systems? <coughs> okay, so let me start by telling you a little bit of background about coding schemes. So a coding scheme has two algorithms, encode and decode. Uh, and the way you use the coding scheme is you get an, a message as input, you encode it to get a code word, uh, and then you decode the code word to get back the original message. Okay, so what is the point of applying the encoding and then the decoding? Well, there are certain properties that we expect uh, from a coding scheme. Um, and these can be different in different settings. So one property that is desirable that we might require of a, or might expect from a coding scheme is called error detection. Um, and this says that if less than d bits uh, of the code word are modified, where D is the distance of the code, then it, uh, when the receiver gets <coughs> the modified code word, the receiver should either be able to output the original message, or he will output bot in case he uh, detects that a modification occurred. Um, error correction is a stronger property, and this says that if less than D over two bits are modified, where D is the distance of a code, then when the receiver gets the modified code word, now the receiver has, will have the guarantee that he can always recover the original message. Um, another type of guarantee that we are interested in is called non-malleability. And non-malleability is a relaxation of error correction. And non-malleability allows the possibility that all bits of the code word might be modified, or as I'll talk about in this talk, tampered with. Um, however, uh, we get a weaker guarantee. So we're no longer always guaranteed to recover the original message. The guarantee now says that in some cases, we may actually output a valid message, which is different from the original message. So non malleable codes were introduced by Dzimbowski, Piacek, and Wicks. Um, and they were originally proposed as a generic way of protecting a secret key, which is stored in memory, against tampering. And intuitively, the security guarantee that we get from non malleable codes say that if an attacker tampers with the code word, when we decode the tamper code word, one of two things happens. Either the underlying message is unchanged, or the underlying message is changed, but it's unrelated to the original message. And it turns out that this type of security guarantee is enough to ensure privacy of a secret key, which is encoded using a non malleable code. Okay, and of course, in order to achieve the security guarantee, we have to restrict the types of tampering that are allowed. So if you consider tampering uh, with any efficient function, so any tampering function in P, then it's very easy to show in possibility results that uh, tampering functions are impossible, that non malleable codes are impossible for this class of tampering functions. And later in the talk, I'll talk about uh, specific classes of tampering functions for which we can actually construct non malleable code. So this is a picture which shows what can happen when you have a non malleable code. So you take your message M and you encode it. And now, uh, so tampering is illustrated by taking a hammer and a, 
hammering this set of beads. Uh, and the non malleable guarantee says that one of two things happen. So either the hammer is entirely missing the beads, in which case the underlying message is completely unchanged, or you manage to actually grind up the entire code word into something completely unrecognizable, and then when you decode, you're going to recover a completely unrelated message, uh, M prime. So another uh, concept that has been studied uh, is leakage resilient codes. Um, and in this case, we want to have the property that if you're given partial information about the code word, uh, this should not reveal any information about the underlying message which is being encoded. Okay, and so non malleability plus leakage resilience, this gives us uh, security against side channel attacks which include tampering uh, and leakage. So uh, what is uh, the problem with non malleable codes um, that we're trying to address uh, in the prior work? So essentially, non malleable codes uh, work when you have, let's say, a short cryptographic key that you're trying to encode, um, but they are unsuitable for the setting of random access computation. So let's say you start out with a message M, which consists of N blocks. So say you have a database, for example, as your underlying message. And let's say you'd like to apply the non-malleable code to the entire database to protect it against tampering. So of course you can do this. You can simply apply the encoding scheme to the entire database. However, there is going to be a drawback to doing this. And the drawback is going to be that now in order to decode and recover a single block of the underlying message, so let's say a single row, of the database, you're going to have to actually decode everything, decode the entire database, even if you just want to recover that one block. And additionally, if you want to update a single block of the original message, let's say a single row of the original database, again, you're going to have to decode the entire database, the entire code word, modify the block that you want to modify, and then re-encode. Uh, the entire thing. Okay, and so one trivial thing that you can try to do is you can just take every uh, block of your message or every entry of your database and you can apply a non malleable code to each block. And the problem with doing this is that um, you're actually not going to get the type of security guarantee that you'd like. Um, so there basically trivial attacks that show that this is actually malleable. So basically the attack is going to be that you're going to modify, uh, you're going to replace some encodings with fresh new encodings of um, messages of your choice and other encodings you're going to leave the same. When you decode the entire database, you're going to get a highly related database. So uh, the solution to this problem was proposed uh, in the prior work, um, joint with uh, Liu, Shi, and Zhu. Uh, and we proposed the notion of locally decodable and updatable codes. Um, and this does exactly what you would expect. So you take in a message uh, of n blocks, m1 to mn. You run the encoding algorithm. The original encoding algorithm will make a linear scan over the entire message and encode it. But now you have the property that if you would like to decode some particular block i of the original message, you only have to read a few blocks of the code word. And additionally, if you want to update some particular block j of the original message and update it to some other message m prime, again, you only have to modify a few blocks of the, um, of the code word. Okay, and so we're going to call this property locality. So the locality of decode and the locality of the update. So it turns out that defining non-malleability for locally decodable codes is uh, slightly tricky. Um, and the reason for that is that if you're 
code is locally decodable, what can happen is that an attacker might modify a few blocks of the code word, and when you decode some other index, you're not even going to notice that these other blocks were modified because you're, you're never going to touch them. So, um, and it will turn out that when, when you decode the whole thing, these blocks that were touched might decode to invalid, um, and all the other blocks that are untouched will decode properly. And so our definition of non malleability is exactly going to say that this is the only thing, essentially, that an attacker can do. So an attacker can destroy some blocks of the underlying message and leave other blocks the same, or the attacker can just essentially destroy the entire original message and replace it with a new unrelated message. Okay, so this is essentially what I was just saying. Okay, so uh, again, so the tampering function can only do one of two things. So you apply a tampering function to the entire code word, and now when you decode the modified code word, you're always going to be in one of two cases. So either the attacker managed to destroy some blocks of the underlying code word, getting them to decode to invalid, and leaving everything else the same, or the attacker managed to modify a block of the underlying message to some unrelated string, in which case the entire decoding of all the blocks should be decoding to some unrelated message. Okay, so putting it all together, our notion of locally decodable and updatable codes is going to achieve all the properties. So we achieve the modified uh, definition of non-malleability, non we achieve uh, leakage resilience, and we achieve locality. Non-malleability against what? Like your function class cannot include updates, for example, right? So right now I'm just talking about the notion. So right. I didn't, mean, so yeah, so there's going to be some particular class of tampering functions for which you can achieve this definition. So if the class includes your update, then it's trivially malleable, right? Right, yeah. totally clear is a, a possibility result because if the decoding is probabilistic, I mean, if decoding is deterministic, I can indeed imagine that exactly what I need to read to decode symbol five, I'll just destroy it. And, but if the decoding is kind of highly probabilistic, is it totally obvious? So we don't have a formal impossibility result for requiring this weaker definition. Intuitively, it seems like you need it. And moreover, this weaker definition was sufficient for our application which was uh, tamper and leakage resilient RAM. The reason it's sufficient for that is that if you're running a RAM program on the um, encoded memory, if you ever read a symbol which is bot, then you can just tell the RAM program to abort. And if you don't read a bot symbol, we have the guarantee that everything uh, will either be the same or unrelated. the relation between this and the usual notion of locally decoded codes, which where updates are problematic? Um, I think this is the same notion of, um, so I am not completely familiar with uh, that area, but I think it's the same notion of locality, um, except we but have... In terms of the like, fault tolerance, right, so in the standard locally decoded code, you mean that the so-called smoothness, that if I want to read the, the i item, then uh, I read the few symbols of the code word which are kind of evenly distributed and then there's a problem with doing updates because you need to, so how, how does your... Uh, I mean I'll get to our, cons I'll d discuss the construction, I'm not sure. There is no full tolerance, right? There is no distance requirement uh, at all, right? So bottom is totally, you know, valid at the moment. You detect something. So you're not attempting to, to, to recover from the right. errors of errors. Right, you're right. right, essentially. Okay, so this is very yeah. different from the other. Okay, so the main motivation for um, for introducing these codes was what I mentioned to get uh, tamper and leakage resilience in the RAM setting. Um, and basically the construction is um, very simple. So we start with uh, an, an ORAM scheme. We use the ORAM scheme to um, 
set up the uh, memory. And then we use our uh, locally decodable and updatable non malleable code to encode the entire memory on top of the uh, ORAM. And now, uh, whenever the uh, CPU is issues um, a write request to some position J with some um, message M prime, then we simply are going to use the update algorithm from the locally decodable and updatable code. And whenever uh, we have a read instruction, we're simply going to use um, the decode uh, instruction from the coding scheme. OK. Um, and the reason why we need ORAM will be clear later, I think, when I present the formal security definition. But basically, the idea is that we're not hiding the access pattern. So the non malleable code doesn't hide um, the access pattern. And we'll see that uh, in a few slides. OK, so now finally I can get to the previous work. Uh, so what actual classes of tempering functions can we uh, protect against? So um, in our prior work, uh, we showed a construction of leakage resilient, locally decodable, updatable, non malleable codes with um, log and locality. Um, and so by this, I mean that in order to perform a decode, you're going to have to um, access log and positions of the code word, and in order to perform an update, you're going to have to access login positions of the code word. And the tampering functions that we allow are called split state uh, tampering and split state leakage. What this basically means is that the code word gets split into two parts, and you assume that the tampering and leakage are independent on the two parts of the code word. Um, and I should also mention that this works in the continual setting. So, um, in order to get um, the full result of um, leakage and temporary resilient RAM, we need a notion of non malleable codes in the continual setting where you get to uh, tamper and leak as many times as you want. Um, there is also an information theoretic construction of locally decodable and updatable codes uh, by Shandran et al. Um, however, this only works in the non-continual setting, meaning that you only get to submit a single uh, tampering function. If you want to run it many times, then you have to essentially keep updating and re-encoding the entire memory. So your, if theirs is information theoretic, what is yours based on? Oh yeah, so the, our, our construction is computational. Um, it basically requires um, an authenticated encryption and a Merkle hash, so collision resistant hash function and a uh, one way function. And this omega log n locality, you touch both sides of the split state, right? Yeah. Like each time. Yeah. Right. So that's why uh, you can't just perform an update because the update uh, will be touching both parts and interacting. Yes? Can you, can you say a bit about what's the security definition for the? Uh, I'm going to give kind of a pretty formal definition coming up. Oh, okay. Right. Thanks. Uh, I guess it's right. <laughs> okay, so let me uh, discuss the formal security definition. So basically, we have an ideal real uh, security <laughs> definition. So let me first tell you what the real world is. So as I said, this is a continual setting. So we can consider each round I of the game. So at the beginning of round I, we have the current code word, C hat I, which may have already been tampered with. Um, and now what the adversary will get to do is they get to submit a leakage function, GI, from some class of allowed leakage functions. So for example, split state leakage with bounded <coughs> output length. Um, and now we're going to compute G of C and output the leakage to the adversary. And now the adversary gets to submit a tampering function F from the class of allowed tampering functions. And now, again, we're going to update the code word by applying the tampering function to the current code word. Um, and additionally, we're going to 
have this entity called an updater. So the updater is separate from the adversary. And you should think of the updater as modeling the honest RAM program, which is computing on the code word. Um, and the updater is going to tell, um, essentially tell the, um, the code word which position should be updated. So in this case, UI. And it's also going to have a value uh, that it wants to update to. And then we update the code word. And now we're going to define this additional vector, mi, um, which is essentially the decoding of the tampered code word for all n blocks. So we're sequentially decoding the entire code word to get the original uh, vector, uh, or, or to get the current uh, vector of messages that is currently being encoded. Okay, and then at the end of the game, what we're going to output is basically these results from each round. So the leakage from each round, the decoded messages, decoded vector of messages from each round, um, and also the positions that got accessed at each round. So you can see that the positions are uh, in the clear and we're not trying to hide uh, which positions are being accessed. So this is the real game. Um, in the ideal game, uh, we have a simulator. Um, so I should mention that the simulator doesn't actually have to interact with the adversary. We don't restrict how the simulator works. But just for intuition, I'm going to present the simulator as interacting uh, with the adversary internally. So in the ideal game, we start out with the current vector of messages, mi. So this is the vector of messages after some updates may have occurred. And now the adversary will submit a leakage function. And the simulator has to respond to the leakage function. And now the adversary will submit a tampering function. And now the simulator, remember in the previous game, we decoded the entire tampered code word to get a vector of messages. But this is somewhat unfair to require the simulator to do because the simulator doesn't know uh, the vector m of messages. So instead, what we're going to tell the simulator is to output a set i and a vector w. Um, and then the updater is going to, again, decide which position he wants to update. And we're going to update the underlying message according to this value. And note the simulator does not know the original message or the updated message. OK, so now what do we output in this experiment? So we have to output a vector of messages. So how do we decide what to output? So basically, the simulator outputs a set i and a vector w. Uh, if i is equal to all indices from 1 to n, uh, then it means that this is the bottom case then it means that we output uh, the vector w as the vector of messages. And if the simulator outputs an i, which is not equal to all indices from i to n, then for all the indices in i, we're going to output bot in that position. And for all the other indices, we're going to output the original message. OK, and then the output at the end of the game is going to be all the leakage all of these vectors n, where n is now defined as in the box, and all the positions u1 to ur. So let me give some intuition for why is this the right definition. So at round i, the simulator is going to output the set i and the vector w. The simulator observes the tampering function and has to decide whether he's in one of two cases. So if i is equal to the entire set of indices, 1 to n, then it means that the simulator thinks the whole code word has been changed to an encoding of the vector w, and he must actually produce this vector w on his own. In the other case, the simulator thinks that only the positions in i were modified uh, to bot, and all other positions must remain the same. He has no choice but to output same for all the other positions. So he, you don't insist on self-destruct. So you can go from bot to non-bot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 
Um, but when we combine it with the RAM program, in order for this to be sufficient, then we actually have the RAM program essentially abort if it reads if it reads a bot if it ever reads a bot symbol, it will end up aborting. Um, okay, and just to emphasize what C means, so C means it could mean the original message in that position, or if that position has been updated, then C means the most recently updated value in that position. Okay. No, no. Simulator does not get, um, he only gets UI, he does not get val i, and he does not get to see the original database. Okay, so one type of attack that I want to tell you about, it's very intuitive and it's kind of the right attack to think about in this setting, um, is called a rewind attack. So essentially, in a rewind attack, what the attacker is going to do is he's going to slowly leak some part of the code word corresponding to some specific underlying message block J. He's going to then wait, and he's going to hope that while he waits, <laughs> the updater is going to update message block J into something new. So he's basically going to let the RAM program run uh, for a certain number of cycles. And then after he waits, he's going to write back what he leaked back into the same position. Okay, and so kind of what is the attacker's goal? The attacker's goal is that when he writes back the original values, his goal is that this block, when it is decoded, is going to decode to the original message in that block as opposed to the most recently updated message. Okay, and if the original message for that block gets decoded instead of the uh, most recently updated message, then the simulator can no longer just output same because same corresponds to the most recently updated message. So it means simulator would have to somehow output the value that was originally in that block but simulator can't do that because the simulator doesn't know the original message. Okay, so this type of attack is going to actually break the definition of non malleability Okay, so it may seem that, from what I just said, it may seem that rewind attacks are kind of always possible. It seems like not clear how would you ever prevent a rewind attack from occurring. However, actually the previous uh, positive result, the construction that we had prior to this work, does prevent against rewind attack. And the intuition for why this is possible is <laughs> note that the attacker can only leak a small amount in each round. And additionally, an update is also occurring uh, in each round. So the goal is going to be that when the attacker writes back the leakage, we should have that one of two cases occur. So either the information that the attacker writes back is now going to end up being inconsistent with the rest of the code word because updates have been occurring while he's been waiting off to the side. Or the other case is that the information actually is consistent, but effectively by writing back the old values, the attacker has somehow uh, overwritten the entire code word and caused it to decode to something um, either bot or something unrelated. Okay, so I can finally uh, tell you what the results are. Um, so our, uh, we have a lower bound and a matching upper bound. So the lower bound says that um, lambda is security parameter and pi is a locally decodable and updatable malleable code in a security model which allows for a rewind attack. Then if we restrict uh, to encoding messages of uh, length polynomial in the security parameter, then the uh, encoding scheme pi must have locality, which is at least omega 1. So the encoding scheme must have super constant locality. Okay, uh, and some caveat or some details about exactly which cases the lower bound covers. 
So uh, the lower bound holds for any polynomial block length. So remember that um, we get an input message which has n blocks, uh, and we output a code word which has uh, some other uh, n prime number of blocks. And the lower bound holds for any polynomial block length, polynomial and security parameter. Uh, however, uh, one restriction is that it requires that the access patterns for decoding and update are non-adaptive. So what I mean by non-adaptive <coughs> is that when you decide which locations to access in order to decode or update a certain position i, the next location that you access should not depend on the contents of the previous locations that you accessed. The main result I'm going to talk about today is for deterministic access patterns. So that means that once I tell you the scheme pi, and once I tell you the message length n, the number of blocks in the original message, then you should know for every block i of the original message, you should be able to know which positions of the code word are going to be accessed for a decode and an update. It turns out that we can also extend our result to randomized access patterns. So this would mean that given the uh, scheme pi and the length n of the input and the random coins that decode and update are going to use, given these, you can determine uh, which positions of the code word are going to be accessed for decode and update. Okay, but this is still, not, it's randomized, but it's still non-adaptive. Okay, and in addition, the lower bound holds even if the attacker is only allowed to leak a single bit of information um, in each round. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're saying the security model which allows for a rewind attack. Right. Your security model does allow for a rewind attack. Right, so for example, um, the, result, the prior result that I mentioned, which is in the split state model, this would allow for a rewind attack. Why? Because you can't, the rewind attack just requires you to uh, be allowed to tamper in a way that replaces uh, the uh, information that you leaked, uh, rewrites it into the code word. So you can do this in a split state. You can leak some information and you can write it back. But there could potentially be classes of tampering functions which don't allow for you to write back the information that you leaked. Okay, so it's not the security model, it's what class of tampering function. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> if, it allow, if the class allows copying and rewriting, okay. then... Right. Okay, and then we have uh, a matching upper band. So uh, if lambda is security parameter, then there exists a locally decodable, updatable, non malleable code pi uh, in a security model which allows for a rewind attack such that pi has locality delta n for any delta n in omega 1. So if you allow the locality to be anything that's super constant, then you can actually uh, achieve uh, a construction of a locally decodable and updatable code. Okay, and just to convince you that the uh, upper and lower bounds are actually matching, so the upper bound is going to actually require large block length, but it's still polynomial and security parameter. So lambda to the one plus epsilon where epsilon is some small constant. Um, and in this construction, the access in our construction, the access patterns are actually uh, non-adaptive and deterministic. Um, and the construction allows for leakage of one minus epsilon prime times chi bits. So chi is the block length, and you can leak uh, a constant fraction um, of the uh, block length. Whereas in the lower band, uh, it holds even if a single bit is leaked in each round. Okay, and so the upper and lower bounds are tight in this setting. So does epsilon depend on delta sample? So what is the price? No. So you said orbital. These are just, con these are just two constants. Uh, so what is the price? You said any super linear locality, so if I make it like log star of n? Yeah. So what is the price? I mean, just, uh, I'll just add it log star of n and no price. What is the trade-off? What do you mean? Uh, no, there's no trade-off. So basically, uh, you need, you're going to have a Merkle tree, 
Um, and the Merkle tree is going to have super constant depth because the number of leaves in the Merkle tree is n, and you don't know a priori, um, you know, for any depth that you set, you can pick an n which is larger than, uh, than that depth. Uh, so I think you'll see, so I'll talk about the, uh, the construction, and I think you'll see uh, where it's coming. Uh, okay, so let me talk about the tools for the lower bound, um, and then I will actually show you, so the lower bound is actually an explicit attack on any scheme with constant locality, um, as well as analysis of the attack. And then as time permits, I'll quickly discuss the upper bound, which is very pretty simple, um, and then I'll talk about some conclusions. Okay, so the, one of the main tools that we use in the lower bound is something called the sunflower lemma. So what is a sunflower? So a sunflower is a collection of sets such that the intersection of any pair is equal to the core. So in this example over here, uh, we have five sets, and each set includes the petal plus the core. And you can see that the pairwise intersection of any two sets is exactly uh, the core of the sunflower. Okay, so what is the context? What is the, sun, the uh, set of sets in our, um, in our setting? So we have sets S1 to Sn. And Si is the set of code word blocks that are going to be accessed during decode or update of the ith message block. So it's the union of the blocks of the code word that are going to be accessed to decode and update the ith block of the, mes of the underlying message. And note that we're assuming that the size of each set si is a constant c. So basically, what we're doing now is we're assuming that we have a locally decodable, updatable code with constant locality, and now, and then we're going to present an attack against it. Okay, so we're gonna assume that we have uh, such a code with co uh, constant locality, what that means is that each set SI has size that's at most constant. So you assume the Peronistic decode update? So here is it important? For now, yeah, for, the, for what I'm gonna show, assume, assume that the locations are deterministic, yes. So if you tell me the description of your encoding scheme, and if you tell me the uh, input length of the number of blocks in your input message, then I know each of these sets, S1 to Sn. Okay? Um, and the size of each coder block, we're going to call that chi, as before. And this is some um, arbitrary uh, polynomial in lambda. And lambda is security parameter. So the celebrated sunflower lemma of Erdos and Rado says, that if the number of sets, S1 to Sn, if the number n of these sets is greater than C factorial times K to the C, then this set of sets, sigma, must contain a sunflower of size K plus one. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're gonna look at the set of blocks of the code word that are accessed to decode, each decode and update each location from one to n. And we're gonna say that there must exist a subset of these sets which forms a sunflower. And how are we going to set these parameters? So what we're going to want is we're going to want to have a sunflower which has size greater than c times chi. So remember, c is the number of blocks that are accessed for decode and update, it's a constant. And chi is the size of each block. We'll see why we need this uh, in a minute. Okay, and what should we note? So since C is constant, so even though this expression here has like C factorial and K to the C, since C is constant, it turns out that uh, we can choose N polynomial in security parameter lambda and still be guaranteed that for this uh, choice of N, we're guaranteed to have a sunflower of size at least k. Okay, so the second tool that we're going to need um, is a defining a compression function. 
So given a sunflower, so these are the sets, this is a subset of sigma that forms a sunflower. So for example, what this means is that the positions of the covert access to decode and update positions I0, I1, dot, 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 IK form a sunflower. Uh, so we're given a sunflower and we're given some code word, C hat. And now we're going to define a compression function. So the compression function is going to take as input uh, a vector of K inputs where each position in the vector is either zero, one, or same. And it's going to output something of length c times chi bits. So what is the compression function doing? So uh, essentially what it's going to do is it's going to take the values of x1 to xk as instructions of whether or not to update the corresponding block of the underlying message and if yes, what to update the corresponding block to. So basically the compression function is just going to uh, consist of a loop for i equals one to k. It's going to loop through all the inputs. Uh, if xj is not equal to same, then it's going to run the updated update procedure on code word c hat with uh, position ij and uh, value xj. And then at the end, it's going to output uh, the core of the sunflower. Okay, so basically it's going to do k updates, or possibly not if it's equal to same, at most k updates. Uh, it's going to be continually updating the code word. And then finally, it's going to output the core of the final code word. Uh, sorry, the core of the sunflower, which corresponds to uh, some blocks of the underlying code word. So why is this a compression function? So um, recall that we chose exactly this. We chose k to be greater than c times chi. So what this means is that um, that this is indeed a compression function. The uh, input length is larger than the output length. Um, and additionally, um, we know that the size of the core is at most c times chi bits because the core of the sunflower is contained in each set of the sunflower, and each set of the sunflower consists of at most c blocks. Each block has size <coughs> chi. Okay, so this is our compression function. And the last ingredient that we're going to use is um, a theorem on stability, um, which was stated by Drucker and also um, appe appeared previously in some other works. And actually what I'm gonna state here is a special case of the theorem, which uh, is what is relevant for our setting. So basically it says that if we have a compression function, which is a randomized mapping, uh, and we have independent variables, x1 to xk. Then with high probability, if we choose at random one of the input variables to fix, so in this example, I chose uh, xi to fix the same, then the output distributions are statistically close when I run the compression function on x1 to xk chosen independently and uniform at random, and when I run the compression function on everything chosen uniformly at random, except for the i-th position, uh, which is set to c. Okay, and the intuition for this is that since it's a compression function, I can't really output the value of x in each location. And so there are some locations that I won't really notice a change in the output uh, if the input uh, is getting fixed. How is i quantified? <coughs> um, so i is chosen at random from the set uh, 1 to k. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mean to assume that same has, has um, at least 
least some non negligible probability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, so I'm assuming there's one third probability on zero, one third probability on oh, one, okay. and one third probability on the same. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so let's try to put all these ingredients together uh, in order to get uh, the lower bound. So what is going to be the attack? So uh, basically what the attacker is going to do is it's going to first look for the sunflower. Um, and so the, the attack is going to be a rewind attack, I should mention, as we talked about before. And the cleverness of the attack is just going to be which positions should I leak and write back. Okay, everything else, um, it, it's just a regular re rewind attack. So how does the attacker going to decide which positions to leak and write back? So he's going to first look for the sunflower that's uh, guaranteed to be contained in the sets S1 to Sn. And he can uh, do this efficiently. Uh, then he's going to choose a random index, J. And J is going to be uh, the position that he's going to leak information on. So he's going to uh, leak information about the uh, corresponding uh, blocks of the code word that are used to decode position ij, decode and update position ij. And what is he going to leak? He's going to leak the pedal corresponding to the set uh, sij. So he's only going to leak the, the pedal, he's going to leave the core intact. Okay, and I'm going to call the leakage that he receives back is going to be called L. Now the attacker is going to sit back and he's going to wait until the K plus first round. Uh, and in the K plus first round, he's simply going to choose the following tampering function. The tampering function is just going to replace the current contents of the pedal with the original contents of that pedal. So the pedal corresponding to the set Sij. Okay, so this is just a rewind attack. And now what is the updater going to do? Well, the updater is just going to do essentially what the compression function was doing on the previous slides. So the updater is going to choose values x1 to xk at random from 0, 1, the same. And in round j, he's going to decide, uh, based on the value of xi, whether or not to request an update on position ij, and if yes, whether to update to 0 or to 1. OK, and I am presenting a simplified version of the attack, so um, a small modification is needed if you want to only leak uh, one bit per round. So the way I presented it now, he leaks the entire contents of the uh, pedals uh, in the first round, uh, but he can also be modified to leak uh, only a single bit in each round. It's easy to find the sunflower? Yeah, so he can just find the pairwise intersection of all the sets, S1 to Sn, and then he can choose the one that occurs the most frequently. Okay, so sorry. So he's going to leak the IJ's pedal and then replace the IJ's pedal. Okay, so the analysis is based um, on the following lemma. So um, we can show that for the attack and updater that we specified above, uh, we have two cases depending on whether the original message was the all zero vector or the all one vector. So if the original message was the all zero vector, then we have that with probability at least 0.7, the decoding of position ij in round k plus 1 is going to be 0 in the real game. And on the flip side, if the original message was 1, then with probably at least 0.7, the decoding of position <coughs> ij in round k plus 1 is 1 in the real game. OK, so remember, this is the decoding after tampering. So the attacker leaked, he wrote back, and then he waited for decode to happen. If the original message was 0, then with probability 0.7, he's going to get a 0. If the original message was 1, with probability 0.7, he'll get a 1. OK, so why is this uh, enough to show, to contradict non-malleability? So essentially, 
what can the simulator do? So simulator either outputs same or he outputs one of zero, one, or bot. Okay, but let's say the simulator always outputs same. So if the original message was zero and he always outputs same, then zero is going to be outputted with probability two thirds. Why is that? Because with probability one third, there was no update in that position. And with probability um, another one third, there was an update in that position and it got updated back to zero. Okay, and similarly, if you just output same in the case that the original message was one, it will output one with probability two thirds. <coughs> so what this means is that the simulator cannot always output same. <coughs> And when he does not output same, he has to be outputting zero with higher probability if the original message was zero, and he has to be outputting one with higher probability if the original message was one. But this is impossible because the simulator does not know the original message. So he would not know whether he's in case one or case two. <coughs> okay, so let me talk briefly about uh, proving the lemma. So, um, the decoding of position ij in the k plus first round, so this is after tampering has occurred, uh, is going to consist of L. So L is the value that was leaked and written back. So this is what's contained in the petal uh, of the sunflower set. And it's also going to consist of whatever is contained in the core. Okay, so the positions that are accessed during uh, decode of the IJ position are the union of the positions in the core and the positions in the pedal. Okay, so this is gonna be the view of the decode algorithm. So now we can just do a simple hybrid argument. So first we're going to consider what happens when we run the decode algorithm if the J's position happened to be equal to same. So remember, if the J's position is equal to same, it means that no update occurred to uh, the jth petal of the sunflower. So it means that the attacker is just uh, writing back um, the contents of that petal. Okay, and we know that um, in this case, if the jth position is equal to same, we know that the output of decode must be equal to zero if the original message was zero. So how do we know this? Well, note that none of the other updates to any of the other k blocks are going to be touching the jth petal because they're disjoint. So what it means is that when I ran the update for all these positions, they didn't modify anything in the jth petal. And so now writing back the original contents of the jth petal is not changing anything. So basically, in the case where xj is equal to same, I haven't modified anything at all. Everything is exactly the same. And so by correctness of the decoding algorithm, it must be the case that I will decode to zero. OK, so now on the other hand, what happens uh, in the real game when I actually replace the j position from same to this random variable, which is either at zero, one, same? Well, now I can argue that this must also be equal to zero with high probability. So even though I may have uh, updated the j's position to a one, when I write back the original contents of the j's position, it must be the case that with high probability, I still decode to zero. Okay, and why is this the case? Um, sorry, why is this true? This is exactly because of the uh, distributional stability lemma, uh, which said that uh, these two distributions are statistically close. Okay, and the case for message equal to one um, is analogous. Okay, so I don't have much time, um, and I think the upper band is also less interesting. So I'll go quickly over the upper band. Um, so, uh, let me just tell you what the original construction of the locally decodable and updatable codes was. It's quite simple. So basically, we just uh, encrypt all the data with an authenticated encryption scheme. 
Then we compute a Merkle hash of the encrypted data. Um, and then we encode uh, the secret key and the root of the Merkle hash using a regular non-local, non-malleable code. Um, and basically, uh, the uh, intuition of the improved construction, or the construction that has improved locality, so this construction had log n uh, locality. To improve the locality, we're basically just going to replace the regular Merkle hash data structure uh, with a slightly different data structure. Okay, and this is basically called um, a T-slice Merkle tree. So basically, instead of having um, a single child, each node in the tree can have T children. And when we compute the hash, we don't just compute the hash of all the children together, we actually compute the hash of each child separately and then concatenate it um, in the parent node. Okay, so why is this a desirable data structure? So basically, if we choose T to be lambda to the epsilon for some constant epsilon where lambda is security parameter, then uh, for a fixed polynomial <coughs> N, which is a polynomial lambda, our Merkle tree will have constant depth. If we don't know what N is ahead of time, though, then we cannot have a single fixed constant depth. Um, the Merkle tree will grow with, um, with the particular polynomial n, and this is why we do not get a fixed constant locality. Okay, and the key thing to see is that in the t-slice Merkle tree, so usually in a Merkle tree, it's not to your advantage to increase the number of children uh, because you lower the depth, but now in order to, up, uh, to update and verify the Merkle tree, you're going to have to access all the siblings on the path from the leaf to the root. However, we show that in this data structure, uh, for update and verify, we actually just need to access the path from the root, um, from the leaf to the root, and we can still uh, verify. Um, okay, and so for n equal to uh, polynomial in lambda, um, and for t equal to polynomial in lambda, the height of the tree uh, will be at most delta n for any delta n in omega 1. So that's basically the uh, upper bound. So let me just wrap up because I'm low on time. So uh, we showed tight upper and lower bounds on the locality of locally decodable and updatable codes and security models that allow for a rewind attack. Um, however, our results hold only for non-adaptive access patterns. So in this talk, um, I only showed the result for deterministic and non-adaptive access patterns, but we can also extend our result to the randomized and non-adaptive access pattern setting. Um, and I guess uh, future work would be to either extend the lower bound to the adaptive setting, show that you still need super constant locality, even if the decode and update algorithms may be adaptive, or on the flip side, um, to show an improved upper bound uh, for the adaptive setting to show that maybe if you allow for adaptive decode and update, you can actually get uh, constant locality. Okay, so thank you. <laughs>